And that's about all I have to say tonight, except for one thing. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we call a little wooden boat. And like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life. But I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than Thailand oceans, and swept, more than God three blessed, centuries ago. and teeming with we were people of all kinds, you know, the poor people living in harmony of, of Asia. We lived in the a city with we lived in huts. That and following and the Vietnam War, in which and the Hmong had to be U.S. forces fight the communists, the doors, tens of thousands were, were forced to, to flee, first the to the refugee camps, and, the and then to the United States. That's it was I during the late 1970s and, and early 80s that about 5,000 Hmong made their, their way from Southeast Asia here to San Diego to start a new life. Among them was Ia Vu, one of only six in her family to survive the war. Ia settled in Linda Vista in 1980. 1980, where she raised her family, helping support them through her unique talents in this elaborate form of cross stitching. This one loves. We call it fan dao. Creating elaborate story cloths, capturing through images not only her people's history, but her own personal journey fleeing to safety. So she had to cut bamboo to put it under the arms to help them float across the river to get Her experience nice far fingers. different from members of the Hmong community born and raised here in San Diego, like her son, Richard. Growing up, uh, it was a little bit difficult for me. Like, uh, it was a clash, class of culture. Do you think I did it? Richard is also committed to keeping the Hmong no. culture alive. For the past 20 years, he has served his community as a shaman, a spiritual healer who performs traditional rituals and ceremonies, including weddings and funerals. We help celebrate uh, the person's life to heal them. A crucial part of because those ceremonies is, is the traditional the Hmong clothing the experiences on are remembered. display during the Hmong details New Year are often celebrations. Terrifying and it used to be more planned, more plain. Regular dreams and, and nightmares are usually forgotten or so quickly fade. This is because to the unconscious mind, the details are considered unreal, thus unimportant. Having a waking dream is upsetting because differentiating the real from the unreal is now difficult. Than it was eight years ago. To add to the clarity of memory, Sleep paralysis After 200 also years, strong emotions two centuries, like fear. she is still staying strong and free and clear. And her glow is no steady. Hallucinations oh, are common and often scary. <sighs> what the hell are dreams anyway? Mysteries. Incredible body hocus pocus. The truth is, is we still don't know what they are or where they come from. What do you mean all at once? She's going into deep sleep now. Mm -hmm. The visitor is a little high. Mm -hmm. It's just a good anxiety. Otherwise, she's nicely relaxed. Also, I thought it was a shame. She could dream of it. But I thought it was just another nightmare. I'm like the one I had when I was a slime. There was this... Who's this guy? She's into REMs now. She's stuck here dreaming now. It's a good one, too. Typical dream parameter. A nightmare now would be plus or minus. It's a familiar anecdote among horror fans. Wes Craven was inspired to write A Nightmare on Elm Street after coming across an LA Times newspaper article about Southeast Asian immigrants in America suddenly, mysteriously dying in their sleep after suffering terrible dreams. It's so familiar, people seem rarely to probe the anecdote, not even noticing that Craven himself seems to be misremembering the details of what he read. He has said the article was about Cambodians who had fled the killing fields of the Khmer Rouge, but no LA Times article matching that detail seems to exist from the time Craven would have been inspired. The article he read was almost certainly about refugees from the Hmong ethnic group who had fled the path at Lao after supporting the United States' so-called secret war in Laos. Decades later, 
a clearer picture began to emerge about these nocturnal attacks. And disturbingly, it began to seem that a demonic figure was haunting the Hmong people's dreams, killing them in their sleep. Theirs is a story that has startling parallels to the tale told in A Nightmare on Elm Street, much more than Craven could have known at the time. It's a tale of how culture affects our lives and our health, and it's one that challenges the distinction between science and belief, between biology and culture, between dreams and reality. By superpositioning this true story with Wes Craven's seminal film, we begin to see the Elm Street movies, and all horror movies, the nightmares of a half-awake culture, in a different light. This is What Dreams May Come, Part 1. If you want to hear the gang drunkenly dissecting and debating the 1984 movie, jump ahead. That's coming up. Don't worry. But first, we really need to talk about what happened to the Hmong in America. The Hmong are an ethnic group found in parts of China, Vietnam, Thailand, and Laos. Their religious beliefs, like those of many people all over the world, are a form of animism. That is, they see the existence and interplay of spirits in people, animals, and nature. During the Second Indochina War, the broader Vietnam War, with its interconnected conflicts in the neighboring countries of Cambodia, Laos, and beyond, the Hmong living in the Laotian hills were secretly trained by the CIA to be guerrilla fighters to support the conservative Royal Lao government against the communist army, the Pathet Lao. Since Laos was supposed to be a neutral country, America's involvement in the Laotian Civil War in the 50s and 60s was undisclosed and classified. For that reason, Americans refer to it as the Secret War. The Secret War was anything but a secret in Laos, however, which was so heavily bombarded by American forces that it became the most bombed country in history. Despite this, the American-backed side lost in Laos as they lost in Vietnam, and the communist path at Lao eventually assumed control of the country in 1975, forming the modern Laotian state. The Laotian Hmong suffered heavy casualties in the war, with almost a third of all Hmong men killed. And after they ended up on the losing side, their position was precarious, as they found themselves threatened with reprisals and genocidal violence by the new regime. Thousands of Hmong fled to Thailand, some carried by American planes, many more crossing hundreds of miles on foot or fording the dangerous Mekong River. In Thailand, they ended up crowded in refugee camps. Many sought to relocate to the country that had sponsored and encouraged their participation in the secret war, the United States. The USA accepted to resettle many Hmong refugees in the 70s, but there was a catch. The American government was apparently eager to avoid creating new ethnic ghettos in their cities, so a federal scattering policy was put in effect. This policy deliberately broke up Hmong families and subgroups, randomly dispersing the refugees across 53 cities in 25 states. The intention, to break the connections to their culture in order to force assimilation, was made clear by the words of one official with the Rhode Island Office of Refugee Resettlement, who said that the Hmong were being spread, quote, like a thin layer of butter throughout the country, so they'd disappear. This forced attempt at Americanization meant that the new arrivals were abruptly amputated from their cultural and religious connections. Understandably, they struggled to adapt in the strange new land. And then, the nightmares began. It was in 1977 that some doctors began to notice incidents of Hmong people, mostly young men, dying mysteriously in their sleep. In most cases, the men appeared healthy, and the autopsies revealed no explanation for why their hearts suddenly stopped. Proportionally, the number of deaths was unaccountably high. In some regions, such as Orange County, the mysterious nocturnal killer appeared to account for more than half of all deaths recorded in the Hmong communities. And many of the victims were plagued by terrifying dreams leading up to their deaths. An LA Times headline from 1981, possibly the one that caught Craven's eye, labeled the phantom illness Nightmare Syndrome. In the late 80s, the killer was officially named Sudden Unexpected Nocturnal Death Syndrome, or SUNS, though medical researchers were no closer to identifying the culprit. And yet, for the Hmong people, the culprit was never a mystery. They knew what, or rather who, was killing them in their sleep. 
it was an evil entity called Dacho. The evil being the Hmong called Dacho has been known under different names in different cultures about as far back as we can trace it to ancient Babylonia. It's called Fium in Thailand, Zamora in Poland, Ukumangernik in the Canadian Arctic, and the Old Hague in Newfoundland. It was also known as the Nightmare in English. Mare is traditionally a term for a malicious demon before recent times when the term nightmare started to be used to mean simply a bad dream. The old hag, or nightmare, is something that comes when you sleep and stops you from moving. It may lurk in the corner, just out of sight, emanating a threatening evil intent, or it may sit on your chest, restricting your breathing. In contemporary medicine, this experience is called sleep paralysis, and people are increasingly familiar with the term today. But bizarrely, for a condition that affects 5 to 40% of the population, depending on the study, just 40 years ago, sleep paralysis was almost unknown in modern Western medicine. We now understand sleep paralysis as a disruption or unsinking of REM sleep processes, wherein the body is paralyzed, biologically asleep, but the mind becomes awake, aware. For reasons that are imperfectly understood, this unnatural combination of sleeping body and waking mind is often accompanied by a conviction that the victim is being visited by the evil spirit known around the world under different names. Part of the reason why our science has struggled to describe and incorporate sleep paralysis may be that it challenges the traditional Cartesian divide. This is the split between mind and body, the idea foundational to our science that the things we can test and measure and the things we believe belong to separate categories. Waking and sleeping are supposed to be two separate states, and yet during sleep paralysis, the sufferer is literally both asleep and awake at the same time. Further complicating our understanding, it's clear that the cultural beliefs of the victim influence the effect the attack has on their body. One well-known phenomenon that seems to undercut the Cartesian divide between mind and body is the placebo effect. If we believe something will make us better, often it will. The lesser-known inverse of this is called the nocebo effect. If we believe something will harm us, it likely will. We are often forced to deal with the truth that cultural beliefs and our health are not separate. They are intertwined. Attacks of Dacho, the evil nightmare spirit, are well known among the Hmong of Laos, but are believed to be almost never fatal in their home country. Their religion provides them with traditions that offer support and comfort. Shamans may be called in to dispel the evil from the afflicted, and animal sacrifices to ancestors provide spiritual armor. But in America, the dispersed and isolated refugees were without protection. It was in the early 2000s that American anthropologist and medical researcher Shelley Adler finally started to put the pieces of the puzzle together. It had been known for a while that the Hmong were genetically susceptible to cardiac arrhythmia. This is a flaw in their heart that can be dangerous, but it's relatively common and can't, on its own, account for the high rate of nocturnal deaths, nor the fact that it's much more common among immigrants. The connection was found in the emerging field of biosocial studies, an attempt to resolve the problematic Cartesian divide by studying the ways our beliefs and our health are intertwined. Without their religious rituals and the administrations of a skilled shaman, the Hmong immigrants were left so vulnerable to Dacho's nocturnal assaults, the evil spirit literally scared them to death by triggering fatal cardiac arrhythmia. Pop culture is a society dreaming of itself. Unprocessed desires and fears mingle with inherited half remember narratives projected on a flickering screen. In a country like the United States, where assimilation is a national creed and ancestral knowledge is intentionally erased, sometimes these dreams are the only ties people have to the buried cultural beliefs that once bound them together. The American project promoted by President Ronald Reagan in the early 80s, the period from which the Nightmare on Elm Street films emerged, was proudly assimilationist and homogenizing. They promoted cultural sameness, 50s-style conformist nuclear families and identical suburbs across the nation as an ideal. The shining city on a hill of Reagan was proudly separated from the valleys of different cultural traditions. Wes Craven called it a nightmare on Elm Street because it could be anywhere. Every suburban town across America has an Elm Street, 
and they're all functionally identical. Craven grew up in an intensely repressive religious American family. He was raised by strict evangelical Baptists who forbid popular culture. Growing up, Wes wasn't allowed to watch movies. The Baptist church believed that these cultural dreams were a dangerous influence. So maybe it's not surprising that an important theme in A Nightmare on Elm Street, Craven's masterpiece, is how the parents' attempts to hide knowledge from the younger generation only gives the repressed secret more power to harm. Because the children can't engage with the buried story of Freddy Krueger, they can't protect themselves against him, they aren't armed with the necessary knowledge and unopposed, he's able to become powerful enough to murder them in their dreams. Long after Craven first glimpsed a newspaper article about the mysterious plight of Hmong refugees, it's eerie how the film he was inspired to make and the conclusions reached by those studying the real-life case converged on the same idea. Our beliefs and our dreams have importance and influence beyond what we can immediately see or measure. We separate ourselves from that at our own peril. Humans are creatures made up not just of sinews and hormones, but of thoughts and stories, and this is all connected in ways we barely understand. It can be tempting to try to flee the scary things, the bad dreams, the frightening movies, but engaging with the horror, immersing yourself in the tradition, trying to untangle the threads, forging a community around it, may provide understanding and armor in subtle but essential ways. Let's keep talking about horror movies, the nightmares of our collective consciousness, and let's move on to Elm Street. Welcome back to Mind Over Splatter. It's, it's been a while. Uh, we're just coming back for one last final hurrah, a mini season that uh, I'm thinking of calling it um, What Dreams May Come. You know, maybe a little on, on the nose, but <laughs> What Dreams May Come? Oh, I thought, I thought you said Maybe you'll dreams. finally use the title I suggested in our first episode of Grasping at Claws. Oh, that's right. No, I already used that as a title of the episode, though. So You can give it like three titles, like uh, like a later 90s action film or something. <laughs> you can just call it Insurrection or Resurrection. Nobody thought of Dreamweaver. I know you can get me through the fright. <laughs> oh, not bad. <laughs> not great either, but thanks, though. The guest coming in <laughs> hot with the hot titles. <laughs> <laughs> so as you've uh, probably figured out, we are... Um, tying up a loose end and finally getting around to doing the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. In past episodes, we have covered the entire Halloween franchise, Friday the 13th. This will cover the big three, right? Yeah, yeah. So I guess it was... Saving the uh, best for last. (laughs) I don't know about that. If you've listened to the show before, you probably know where we're going with this. If you haven't, well, we're going to go through the movies one by one, and we're going to rank them as we go. So each new movie we discuss will be compared to the ones before it. So we'll end up with uh, four separate rankings of uh, how we best like these movies. Four because we are four people here tonight. I'm Dylan uh, in Montreal. You're getting a good wheat beer from La Mouche and Natash Kwan. And we've got... Two of our regulars and uh, and a new voice as well. Uh, Scott, welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for dropping in. Absolutely. What are you uh, drinking tonight? Some tall Stellas, the Artois, some kind of uh, scotch, <laughs> and uh, I'm eating some pizza. <laughs> we, we've a, heard, yes. It's Dewar, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Dewar Scotch and Aladdin's Pizza. Shout out to Aladdin's. That's the misspelling of Aladdin's with one D in Winnipeg, Manitoba. <laughs> good old Aladdin's uh, doers that reminds me of uh, sleepaway camp to nice. mom she was a doer <laughs> the dedication at the intro you guys have you guys covered sleepaway camp yet uh it's come totally. up in favorite slashers of all time yeah, yeah. our first episode that's... was our, our favorite slasher yeah, movies and i put it we had a lot I put of number one camp. all right it's my favorite Pamela springsteen and number two i think it is yeah. oh yeah oh yeah all right i just you know what i just found out about her i had no idea that was bruce springsteen's sister you <laughs> no that's the ha- first thing you're supposed to know you heard her last <laughs> name that's all that there is you, about you should have been asking that question way earlier yeah. i just found it out so uh, cool. sheldon's back with us uh, as usual hey sheldon how's it going hello baby <laughs> i'm big <laughs> bottle. You can cut that. I'm drinking uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what are you drinking? I have two open now. I'm drinking a Pabst Blue Ribbon, which are gross. 
Yeah, but Heineken is shit. <laughs> what? <laughs> Normally I drink Bush, but these were on sale and I made a mistake and I bought them. I'm not happy about it. Leave me alone. And the other one I have <laughs> is a Stanley Park Sangria Crush Sour Tallboy. Tastes like shit. Uh, Will, how's it going? Uh, I'm doing rather good. Yeah, sitting here in Winnipeg oh. drinking something that doesn't have too many syllables. In fact, it's only got numbers. I'm drinking a 1919 from the good people at Little oh, Brown shit, Are we getting paid for this? I would have sold up Stella like what did I my brand? How do you think I can afford this lavish microphone that we didn't even use because it was too loud? Stella <laughs> Artois. Yeah, I know. I'm 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 grooving. We're all grooving here. We're having five different substances at once. We're ready to talk Freddy. Bye. Nice, shit. let's do it. Well, let's start by talking about, as we must, Wesley Craven. So Wes Craven was raised in a very repressive uh, religious environment. It was born in 1939 in Cleveland. His father, who was uh, an alcoholic shop worker, died when he was uh, still a toddler. And he was raised by family members who were evangelical Baptists. Growing up, he wasn't allowed to play games, dance, or watch movies. He couldn't he, dance. He couldn't dance. <laughs> what fuck rule is that? Seeing them that's, enforcing that's still that a thing at a lot of like... <laughs> strict protestant communities it's still a thing Wait, to not dance what, what <laughs> yeah, that, what, how would that hurt anyone it, because it allows the devil to enter your body or something i don't know it's dumb um, so apparently west craven <laughs> all he everybody. needed was all he needed was a kevin bacon and we'd have a very different horror world yeah friday the 13th hmm. <laughs> so the first time he saw a movie he was a senior in college he'd never even seen <laughs> a movie until that point oh, um he got a master's in fine arts with majors in psychology and English from a religious college. Did, it, did they say what movie? It was It's a Wonderful Life. That was apparently, oh, he said nice. that was the first movie that he ever saw. He also studied philosophy at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Uh, he was a teacher for most of the 60s. Uh, he was a college professor in Pennsylvania for a while. He, sta- he taught some high school English in a town in New York State. And eventually he ended up taking a job in the movie industry in New York City. And uh, when I say he got a job in the movie industry, it was like the most unglamorous entry level job possible. He took a job as a messenger for a small studio that was mostly making porns. But uh, he stuck with it and worked his way up to the studio and started getting some behind the camera experience, started doing some editing, started to learn the craft of it. Uh, The studio was mostly making either like straight up porns because this was the early 70s and that was porn was having a moment then. Are Mm -hmm. we going to add in the are we going to add in the porn parody of this? You could enlighten us when we get to that point. There's only (laughs) one and it's a wet dream on Elm Street. That's it. There's only main one. 2000, yeah, main 2011, so we could add it in at the end if you want. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it has a really long runtime, which is surprising. <laughs> what do you mean a really long runtime? Is it it's it's like, like Satin Tango? It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's directed by Terrence Malick. I had two cold showers during it. I was like, okay, there's enough now. He was um, he was working on one of like a more soft core movies, uh, a movie called Together, when uh, Wes Craven ended up in the editing room with the film's director who was Sean Cunningham. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sean oh, Cunningham, no way. Ooh, hmm. Away. Uh, <laughs> Cunningham, who would, of course, go on to uh, produce and direct Friday the 13th much later. So these two guys, uh, their stories have been interwined for a long time. They became good friends. So at one point, Cunningham uh, goes up to his buddy Craven and says, you know, I just got a budget to make a horror movie, and I want you to write something for me. Write, write me a horror movie. And Craven says that his response was basically, I've never even seen a horror movie. <laughs> he's in his 30s at this point. He's in his 30s. He still has not even seen a horror movie. But he agrees to do it. That would make, without any knowledge of horror movies or even seeing a slasher or anything like that, you would think it would be pretty, uh, a unique movie, right? Yeah. And what was it? It was The Last House on the Left. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. He was raised religious. That's... Uh... Well, sometimes you have these horror inter- education <laughs> itself. Well, sometimes mm-hmm. there's these like interesting uninitiated type of people. Like Spike Jones is a real great example of uh, someone who saw very little but made such creative things. Like people who made references to uh, "It's a Wonderful Life" to bring it back to Wes Craven on the set of being John Malkovich, and he literally shrugged at the other actors. Like, what are you talking about? He's like, you've never seen that movie. He's like, no. He's like, he's never seen a Frank Capra. He'd never seen a James. Like he'd just seen so little, no, yeah. no classic cinema at all. All his mm-hmm. ideas were just his own. And so I like that. Yeah. I, the concept that West was coming from a similar standpoint. Yeah. Like he was watching him a lot of movies at this point. He was getting really into cinema, but mm-hmm. he was really into uh, 
like the European titans of the art cinema, like Boonwell and uh, Fellini and Bergman. That's what he was really watching. Mm. He was going through a big Sounds Fellini awful. phase when he was asked to write an exploitation horror movie. And The Last House on the Left does take as its uh, inspiration, The Virgin Spring by Igmar Bergman. Um, I like The Last House on the Left. It's you know, grimy like and it. sleazy as fuck. Ang Lee had a really great line about uh, The Last House on the Left. He said, it's one of the greatest films I've ever seen. And now that I've seen it, it should be banned. <laughs> You know, my favorite one of my favorite things about Last House on the Left is the hackneyed attempt at including humor with the two cops oh. and the lady with the chicken wagon who oh. gives them a ride and the banjo yeah. music and the hijinks of the capital I incompetent capital C cop trademark symbol. Like, for example, Texas Chainsaw Massacre feels like a documentary of deranged sickos in Texas. Mm. Last yeah. House on the Left feels like the deranged sickos got their hands on the cameras and actually had at least some insight into editing skills. Yeah. Like, yeah, we should totally profit off this and have some funny cops. Like yeah. there's an element of just like, this is still bad. It's deranged, but we need to soften our shit in order to make this sell. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's something I think makes it feel even more grimy and sleazy that these weird swings and tones between attempts at humor and, and yeah. grotesque things. And uh, it doesn't really stake out a side, I don't think, which I like too. There's kind of a sinister indulgence and in ha- enjoying hanging out with these degenerates and, and looking down your nose at the good family. But then, of course, there's the violent reprisals. You're very much on the family side as they they punish these these murderous degenerates. Like any good exploitation movie, it, it's taking advantage of the audience's fantasies, their biases, but not really like playing to one side or the other, just strumming those tensions, those strings. And uh, notoriously nasty movie. And its notoriety made it successful for like an exploitation film. Like at the drive-ins, it did great business. It was dogged everywhere by people declaring that it should be banned, which of course made <laughs> it more successful. So for Wes, the fact that this was like surprisingly popular, it was kind of a double-edged sword. Like the negative was that he was cut off from his family because he couldn't hide what he was doing anymore. But uh, the positive was that he saw that he could be a filmmaker. He, he saw a future for himself as a filmmaker. And it was a while before his next movie because he spent years trying to get a drama made. Nobody was biting. Nobody was giving him a budget for any of his drama. So eventually he came to the conclusion that nobody's going to give me a budget unless it's another exploitation horror movie. So the Hills Had Eyes was like five years later, 1977. A lot of similarities in the way that it's like there's like a sick, perverse family unit. And then there is like a supposedly good family unit that are against each other in a staked bloody battle this time out in the deserts of Nevada. Another movie I like. Hills Have Eyes is good, too. Yep. Yeah. Papa Jew. Papa Jew. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Craven moved his family out to California to... Ooh, what was that? Sheldon fell down. <laughs> no, Already? I, I, I sat down very hard. Uh, <laughs> Cameo from Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> anyway let's go back to yeah, the really Whoopi serious uh, yeah. cannibal rape stuff here let's get back to it yeah <laughs> so, so craven pursued his career in, in california it wasn't going too well i mean he did get some stuff done notably he got a tv movie of the week uh, when he did swamp thing but uh, he was struggling financially he lost his house uh he had to borrow money from sean cunningham to pay his taxes one year <laughs> uh started doing a lot of coke by his own admission and just like uh, things weren't going great Uh, When he read an article in the LA Times about Southeast Asian immigrants who were having terrible nightmares and mysteriously dying in their sleeps, and that sparked an idea. So the the person who would make this film happen was uh, was Robert Shea, who started New Line Cinemas. New Line Cinemas wasn't anything at this point, really. Uh, Shea was a guy who had a degree from Columbia. He'd studied in Sweden. He was working with a Museum of Modern Art in New York City when he started New Line as a film distribution company uh, in the late 60s. And at first, they're just distributing films to like college campuses, hadn't really started producing their own movies yet. They had a small reputation. From, they were the first studio to distribute John Waters, first studio to distribute Werner Herzog in America. But it was still like a studio being run out of Bob Shea's rent-controlled apartment in Brooklyn. It's a very small-time stuff. But Bob Shea was in California, and he met Wes Craven. Wes Craven pitched him on this idea. And Shea was like, this is amazing. I'm so lucky that he pitched this idea to me, and I get to make this movie. He didn't know that Craven had already pitched this to everybody in Hollywood, and every studio had turned him down. So he cobbled together enough funding. Very hard to do for this little tiny distribution company. But they got enough money together. A Nightmare on Elm Street. 
hit theaters on November 9th, 1984. A little late to the game, but they did it. What do you mean late to the game? I don't know. All the, you know, the early 80s had whole whack of horror movies before that. Oh, yeah. Late to the slasher game, for sure. Like, yeah, the slasher boom I mean. had uh, had basically peaked already by, by the time you get to 84. But supernatural slasher movies were kind of a different game. Mm-hmm. So many of the terror cycle killer slasher movies had come and gone, but to fold in the dreams and the supernatural element was kind of inventing a different set of rules. Briefly, I mean, I'm sure most most people listening have probably seen it. If you haven't, the general idea is that we're in a town, kind of a very uh, white picket fence suburban town. The older generation had hidden the fact that there was a child murderer, Fred Krueger, who had escaped the law and who they had burned alive as vigilantes and he becomes more powerful and starts killing the teenagers in their dreams. So it, it reveals this a little bit at a time. There's kind of a drip drip reveal of figuring out who this mysterious figure in the dreams is learning the story of Fred Krueger and then learning the story of how the adults cover this up because they thought they would protect the children, or that's the excuse they give for hiding this darkness, this dark past they had for cutting them off from this knowledge was that, it would protect them. It would give them a better life if they didn't know that this happened. But without having that knowledge, they're not prepared. They're not armed against it. That's one of the things I like about the movie. And he, he grows stronger in their dreams because he can't be addressed because the younger generation isn't armed with the necessary knowledge that the adults have. You guys remember the first time you saw Nightmare on Elm Street? Oh, the very first Nightmare on Elm Street. My favorite horror film of all time now. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have been about 10 or 11. Yeah, I'm trying to guess by you know which short-term apartment my mom was living in at the time. <laughs> but corner store guy rented us a bunch of movies for the weekend visitation, nice. and then slipped Nightmare in there. I must have been ten or eleven. <laughs> Absolutely scared the shit out of me and enthralled me and gave me a valid reason not to want to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Just stay up at night and drink fucking diet cokes until you know they're out. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit well no that night it would have been wonder bars you know with the peanut butter crunch in them uh and i think they still had jolt cola or something nice. like it it was some pretty Holy hardcore stuff was, colas, that stuff yeah. was good yeah that, that's the hardcore stuff that's the big guns i have a a trickier memory of the very first one because it's always peering around the corner of a particular friend's house who every single late night whenever we're having a sleepover his parents always watched like they would rent you know, scary movies every single weekend. And that was my first chance to like see them with my neck craning as hard as it can, trying to capture as much as I can before we were forced upstairs to go lie in bed and just listen to the rest of the movie. Cause it was, uh, you know, loud enough. So I've listened to nightmare three <laughs> in its entirety when I was probably five or six, but the first nightmare experience, um, I think I managed to come into it rather young and it was already with a ton of weight. It had so much like baggage and it was, I just kept hearing around me that it's such an amazing movie and it lived up to it as a young person seeing it. I'm like, wow, that was way better than anyone even described to me. So Wait, Scott, you, you said it's your favorite horror movie of all time. Oh, you said that with conviction. That. Hey, don't uh, cut me absolutely. Off. This is your favorite mo- horror movie of all time. Yeah. The last like couple minutes doesn't ruin the movie for you. What? Who me? <laughs> the dumb mannequin from like Spencer's getting pulled through a window, like the sex doll <laughs> thing. Oh shit! Or the Bisquick uh, steps, or the fact that Those when Freddy fine. jumps out from Those behind the tree during the Tina chase, that they split the diopter the wrong way, and he's got his glove on the left hand. Yeah, I've That's seen fine. this movie. I love it, warts <laughs> and all. I love this movie more than I love my own dad. <laughs> that's that not ending, saying though. Much. I like that Billy ending... Madison more than I like my own dad. <laughs> but no, like I can't unsee every flaw in Nightmare on Elm Street. Every tripwire, every mattress on the staircase. It's got a special place in my heart <laughs> that like even if I saw every flaw and knew how many gangsters were involved in the making of it cuz there were, I still <laughs> love it. That la- that that last scene. Oh. <laughs> It's so bad. And whenever I say I love a certain movie, like number one, whether it's my favorite of all time or my favorite horror or my favorite action, 
is that it stretched the limit. It defined for me what a film in that genre could do as a movie. And Freddy Krueger is perfectly cinematic. Forget about the CGI that we have now, where we have an entire Vietnam memorial-sized wall of people who are waiting to skip past to get to the end credit mm -hmm. sequence. <laughs> but just a small team of people doing special effects on what we now consider an older movie are doing so much. Mm. But like the original nightmare for me was not only frightening and groundbreaking, but even aside from the minimal practical effects, just editing, just cinematography. Yeah. Like, yeah. let's have her, you know, get woken up on her rose trellis and have her wake up in her bedroom with that same rose trellis. Very simple, just carrying a prop from one location to another. But an absolutely, like, just surreal experience of a movie. How simple and wonderful it could be. Mm -hmm. Warts and all, like I say, rudimentary film. You can see the wires when they shouldn't show up. But really appreciate just, like, what a ragtag team it was pulling off what they could even without pay at some point. It's like, that's a special project. You know? It's just eerie and charming more than it is scary. Yeah, I, I think the aesthetics work really, really well. And it's such a massive upgrade from The Last House on the Left and The Hills Have Eyes to A Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, I'm sure like uh, Jacques Haitken's cinematography is a big part of that too. But I think Craven was just showing how much he believes in the material that he's really putting a lot of thought and care into it in a way that he wasn't in the cheapies before. I think he really, really believed in the script a lot. And it, it shows in the care that's put into like creating the atmosphere and the dream sequence, the multiple dream sequences. You can see the inspiration from maybe film noir, definitely from like Bunuel movies and like surrealism. The editing's good. The interesting shots are pieced together in a way that really creates atmosphere. It has tons of atmosphere. Oh, and I would it, say um, I feel like there's a little bit of Argento in Nightmare as well. Mm -hmm. the, oh, yeah. the major color keys in Suspiria come through in Nightmare again. The blue shades of like Tina's death sequence, the blue shades in that bedroom. And then it yeah. just gets darker and darker blue. Like by the end there, with when the final. Uh, oh, absolutely, and we'll see that type of color scheming and usage yeah. come up in in reference in the sequels. Absolutely, mm -hmm. up to and including uh, Freddie v. Jason, where we're going to see that Argento esque palette uh, reference. Well, you've almost made Freddie versus Jason worth talking about. <laughs> Way to gank my Argento reference and pick it up. <laughs> And carry it five yards across the goal line. Hey, that's me. <laughs> it, it, it is a genuinely scary movie, too. And that's like rewatching it uh, for the first time in years. I was I was scared. Like, it's it, yeah. it's got... Uh... What, in Freddy vs. Jason? <laughs> the movie made yeah, no too. sense. Is that what we're talking about? <laughs> no, we're still... No, we've got a lot of road nightmare. to go to get there. We, gotta, okay. we don't have yeah. to get there. Sorry, I was getting ahead of us. I'm like, why is Jason afraid of the water? It makes no sense. You'll, you'll be halfway <laughs> stumbling home by the time we get to Freddy and Jason. <laughs> no, you're going to carry me. Yeah, maybe I'll carry you. I'll still keep online. I can, I still I can, have a case of beer. Right? I'll, I'll switch it to my phone. Yeah. I like the way it keeps you off kilter, too. The first transition we have, you know, we start out in a dream sequence, and then when you transition to what is what should be the real world... We start off on like the kid skipping rope and it's initially like yeah. we fade in from white. It seems slightly slowed down. So the transition is the same kind of transition you use to show the start of a dream sequence, but you're using that transition to show the start of reality. Yeah. I really like that merging. And that's something that the sequels kind of don't get that the kids like chanting the song are doing that in the real world. That's used in like every other movie to indicate that you're in the dream world, but that's not where they are in the, in the original movie. And I like, I have to disagree. <laughs> I, I hear what you're saying about like on the way in and those little mm -hmm. girls are doing the jump rope and that's in reality, like the reversal of the establishing of the environment, those moments where I can't remember a technical term for it, but in the screenplay, instead of fade in from black, it's burn on white where it's white and blotted out and finally comes into the scene. Mm hmm. Those girls are not in reality. They're still in the dream space, but that incredibly blurry white aura that we're getting is Dorma Vaglia, that moment where you're still waking up and everything's uh, all mixed together. That makes because sense. Because those girls, like they come up in numerous sequels, but only as a sign, people are still asleep, even though they think they're about to be awake. Well, it's like, and oh, you guys are going to hate me for this, but... Uh, uh, 
the one of the only films in the series, the <clears throat> 2010 film that shall not be named, does they were play, on Elm Street. Uh, uh, it kind of acknowledges that a concept of like micro sleeps, like that there are oh, multiple fuck. kinds of sleep states that we can be yeah. in. Yeah. And I mean, mm-hmm. now I shouldn't say that it's the only one that acknowledges it. It's the only one that punches you in the face with that knowledge. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, Nightmare, as Scott was putting it there, like it, it still is addressing that there are, there are alter, there's different states of it's not just REM sleep that you have to enter into for yeah. Freddy to kick in. There are halfway states, and that's true in like contemporary mm-hmm. dream science. You know, we think of everything as being either your mind is processing reality and you're awake, or either it's your mind is hallucinating and you're asleep. But there's actually gradations in different stages that are neither or both. Like what the Southeast Asian refugees were suffering from was a form of sleep paralysis. And sleep paralysis is a state where you are both awake and asleep at the same time. You are mentally awake and your body is physically asleep and you're experiencing both processes at the same time. You know, there are in between states and, uh, you know, other cultures often sleep not in the same way we do, where it's like one block of sleep, one block of being awake. And, and they're more familiar with these in-between states. And to have that incorporated in the aesthetics of the movie is pretty cool, too. Because it also speaks to the way that, that things merge into one another. Beliefs that we have or that things that we've half remembered that we can't put into words, but maybe we heard something whispered somewhere. You know, reality and imagination get mixed up. Dream and real life get mixed up. And I think that's a big part of the movie, too. And the way that... The, the adults think that they can put this firm divide between there's things you know and you don't know and you're not going to know about Freddy. And that means that he has no power, but he actually has more power because they've put this barrier down because they've said that we're not going to speak about it. So nobody's prepared to deal with him. Nobody has the, the equipment, the knowledge to process that into their lives. It makes it a more powerful thing. The, the hidden knowledge of the older generation just gets more powerful because of their attempts to hide it. That's one thing that speaks to me about the movie that I think is pretty cool. Kind of my favorite thing about that whole buried trauma of the very recent past before the first film, All the People of Springwood, is that they often play it like they're trying to hide the children from the evil that was Freddy, which in so many deleted scenes for the first film revealed that Nancy and Glenn, Rod, and Tina were not only children but had older siblings. They were the next crop in line for Freddy, who'd already killed their older siblings. But that the parents act like they're trying to protect their children from the memory of Freddy, when that is just some self-serving bullshit. They're trying to pre- prevent the public from knowing, hey, they all got together and murdered a man. Yeah. And so they have this whole children's self-defense thing. But it's really still their own self-preservation and narcissism. Yeah, parents. they're protecting themselves. Exactly. Yeah, they yeah. committed a crime, whether it was just or not. I think Freddy vs. Jason made this explicit, where fearing mm-hmm. Freddy is what will give him his power to bring him back. Therefore, give everybody the hypnosil so they don't dream. Mm-hmm. Stop talking about Freddy so he fades from public consciousness. Just that entire idea that even knowing about him is what's going to kill you, so it justifies the repression. Which is at least plays thematically well into the films better than, again, we'll come up with this in the sequels, where others is just like, what can kill Freddy? Well, it's either a rhyme or a familial tie that can kill him. Or fire. Or, or just, or just yeah, fucking... Heterosexual it. kissing, part two. <laughs> <laughs> Nightmare two. Because there's all sorts sexual of... Sexual like, confusion. As we go through each one, there's like each film has its different rules, as most slashers do. Number four is villain. a mirror. Yeah. Number five is motherly love. Oh, the fucking mirror. Number six is child who doesn't like you. (laughs) Number seven is box office receipts. (laughs) Sheldon, is this, aside from your disapproval of the ending, which I get it, Wes Craven also was not (laughs) too happy about how the the, the ending turned out. There were some debates about how to end it between him and Bob Shea. It was kind of a compromise ending. But aside from that, is this one among your favorite horror movies? No. No. But it is good. The ending ruined it for me. Even if I turn it off before the ending, I know it's coming and it pisses me off. Yeah, it's it's a really good movie. It's scary. Yeah, it's yeah. It looks the good. Effects, the effects are amazing. I love the uh, the Freddy through the wall effect. That's a great effect. It looks so good uh, when he's coming woman, through the wall behind her bed, or she gets killed on the ceiling. 
yeah. that whole scene. They really awesome. milked that rotating room they built. I love how oh, they yeah. got two cool like effects pieces out of the same rotating room. Uh, both her rolling around the ceiling, which is amazing. And of course, they use that to have uh, Johnny Depp's death, the geyser of blood, pouring out yeah. the ceiling. It falls uh, into a blender. That's crazy. No matter what generation you look at it, there's such innovation in the kills and in the mythos that that first film created. Like the way, mythos. like just having people being killed by this invisible entity in those ways was so incredibly inventive. Another thing I like about the aesthetics is a lot of like really cluttered rooms that I think look great. Uh, this franchise gives us a lot of like bedroom shots for obvious reasons. Uh, yeah. And the cluttered bedrooms look great. The basement looks amazing. The set decorator just went insane in that basement. There's like a fucking tarp on on the wall. There's like a Greg a, Fonseca. A, I think there's even the, dogs playing. Billiards. There's the dogs playing poker on like a rug <laughs> yeah. on the wall. Like the, the set decorator yeah. lost his mind building that. It looks awesome. It's an awesome cluttered space. That, it's a gorgeous house. Those interiors it's magic oh yeah it yeah. is magic in itself the atmosphere of that place yeah mm-hmm. absolutely the big puffy hair is magic on on heather <laughs> langan come on johnny depp uh, oh my god whoever plays yeah. her mom has the worst haircut i've ever seen ronnie blakely yeah, nashville, yeah put some respect nashville. on her name <laughs> that's a bad haircut nashville uh she was on uh, uh she was on the rolling thunder review with bob dylan too Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As yeah. a singer. Yeah, yeah that's her. Oh. Very cool. Like, that's a pretty good haircut? 70s resume right there. Yeah. Absolutely. That's 70s crowd shooting at your ass, yeah. Yeah, her and John Saxon were the two big budget uh, grabbing hires. Yeah. They were the two that, like, if they can get them, they can show they had a picture worth a larger budget. Yeah, like actors that actually cost money. Yeah, yeah everybody else is just getting scale. Because this is still pre-Platoon Johnny, isn't it? Yeah. This is his first movie. This is his first movie. My favorite scene in that movie is when Freddy's outstretched arms creeping the sides of the walls. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That scene scared me. What's cool about that younger. is I feel like that's the kind of thing that you see in a dream that creeps you out. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas yeah. some other movies would just go on flights of fantasy and, and get like, that whole like Looney Tunes. Is the centerpiece to the movie, that entire chase against Tina, that final death kill against Tina. Yeah. Every, every special effect for that is like gorgeous. Yeah. Because you know yeah. when you, when we dream like as real people, and you're trying to run away from whatever you're running from or whatever, it you always seem like you can't run fast enough or you're in slow mo exactly. or yeah, I mean, yeah, or your feet are sinking into sand. You're caught in something. Oh, they you, did do it. Or you, or you can, can run perfectly fast, but it's nothing but a fleet of flying squirrels in the sky blotting out <laughs> the sun. And even though they're super cute, the logic of the dream is they touch me. It's insta rabies. Wow. Oh. I had that dream. I told my students about it, and I don't know that I got across to them in the way that I meant to. <laughs> I do feel like the dream logic and the dream sequences feel like dreams in this movie in, in a way they oh, do yeah. in others. And yeah. I think that's that's awesome. That's what's great about it. Like when his, his arm extends, I could see that happening in my dream, and, and that would be the thing that scares me. That would be like the part yeah. that, that pops well, out, of the, out of the dream and makes it feel so uncanny. There are moments like that, but then there are also moments like when I've watched this movie with people who like, and again, I've loved this movie since I was a little kid, but trying to show it to people, it's like Tina goes out there with no with no pants on and just her shirt. Who is that? <laughs> she wanders out into the yard asking, who is that? Yeah. And there's that scream, another Wes Craven film yeah. element of, oh, doing the stupid thing of going out to investigate a strange noise or something. Oh, someone's hissing your name. Go out in your underwear to check out who it is. <laughs> but there's also in Nightmare, there's the dream logic yeah. of, of course, she's going to end up in her alleyway. Yeah. There's yeah, a way yeah, of doing it where it isn't the dumb slasher character. Like it could have just cut and she finds herself there. But it makes sense in this movie. Well, that's that, totally. and that's a huge theme in all these films is the fact that when we are dreaming, we are powerless. Like, how often do we feel victimized by our dreams? Like, if you have a nightmare that really affects you, do you ever feel like you're ever in control? No, we are not lucid dreaming all the time. If I dream about working, and then I wake up and I have to go to work, that's worse than getting killed in the dream. Yeah. And you're the victim of that. It's the powerlessness. Ness, 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 ness. And that's uh, one of the extra terrifying angles of it. If you realize... If you realize you're in a dream or, or, or more so in this case, like if you're watching someone and you know that they are in a dream, you, you want every part of you to yell, just wake up, 
get out of it because the only solution is to wake up is to uh, completely and utterly escape. There's no f fighting it. And I know that's the great challenge of it where they, the characters have to learn to fight it, but there's something ever terrifying about the fact that you realize we all have dreamt and we all realize that we are victims to our nightmares. We can't fight them. There is no such thing as fighting them. Thinking otherwise is a fallacy, and that's something that this you know, film series tries to challenge in its supernatural side. But that's the thing. Fighting a dream is supernatural. And so when you see someone who's stuck in it, you realize there's no, there is no real escape for them other than hoping that they last long enough to wake up. That's the only hope we have. Just close my eyes again Climbed aboard the dream